Welcome to the episode, Michelle. It's great to have you here today. And I'm really looking forward to our chat. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of it. I love love podcasts. It's a new thing, but I, I, I definitely love being involved. So I appreciate the opportunity. Great, great. Now, I think we met a while ago, quite some time ago, at a Women in Business event. And then recently you came across my feed on LinkedIn because you won a... 40 under 40 award congratulations that's Thank significant you. yeah well done well Pinnacle done. of that's my 2020 yeah really really good and you know I know for myself that getting more comfortable well getting comfortable with numbers in my business is something that I really need to to work on and uh, fortunately fortunately it it took it only took me about six months to realize that keeping receipts in a shoebox was probably not sustainable and a good way to keep records of of things so I did sign up to a subscription-based accounting system which has made things a little bit a uh, little bit easier so I'm looking forward to having a chat about all things numbers in business and hopefully you'll be able to demystify <laughs> some things for myself and the listeners and this episode is particularly relevant for business owners and entrepreneurs who who don't necessarily know a lot about numbers but are keen to know more <laughs> and I think that's most entrepreneurs and small business owners. I don't think anyone other than accountants go into business wanting to know the numbers. Um, so yeah, always a topic that I get asked. So awesome opportunity to be able to talk about it today. Great, great. So let's go back to the beginning and invite you to share a little bit about where you grew up and did you always have a fascination for numbers and know that you wanted to be an accountant or was there a different, different part of the journey? Yeah, a very different part of the journey for me. So I am a Perth born and bred girl. So I uh, grew up here. Um, and no, maths is, is and numbers has not always been my focus or my strong point. Um, I actually wanted to be a lawyer. And I, um, I was more of an English social studies kind of girl in um, high school and had these grand plans to become a lawyer and study law at university. Um, I didn't get the mark and I only just missed out by 0.05% to get into law. Um, but I saw an opportunity in the paper to get a cadetship with the Australian Taxation Office. And they were offering a Bachelor of Taxation, which is part of the law faculty of University of New South Wales. Mm -hmm. So unlike most accountants who have done commerce and focus on numbers, I come at things from a legislation based things. And I think that's the most common misconception with accountants is that what we do is all about numbers. And it actually isn't. It's about getting a set of circumstances and getting a set of tax laws and making those circumstances fit within those laws, um, which is what has piqued my interest about what I do. Um, so, you know, legislation changes all the time, the tax laws change. So the numbers are a byproduct of that. And obviously I need to know the numbers. Um, but for me, it's about getting a set of circumstances, getting a, a set of tax laws and, and whittling away at those tax laws until I get the best outcome. So definitely not your traditional uh, accountant in terms of it's all about the numbers for me. Right. Very fascinating indeed. So you spent some time in the public service for the Australian Taxation Department, yeah, so yeah? I worked for them for three years while I yeah. finished my Bachelor of Taxation and uh, got to experience many different areas of the ATO yeah. and then went to a graduate program at one of the big four accounting firms where I got yeah. into public practice and I've been there ever since. So um, I've always worked helping business owners and that's been a wide range of from individuals just with their you know employment taxes yeah. all the way up to high net worth individuals and large corporations. So bounced around a few accounting firms in my life and landed at Carbon in November 2017 as a partner and I've right. been with them for three and a half years now. Yeah so what what made you switch from working for one of the big four and dealing mainly with you know much sort of larger portfolios and, and corporates to helping individuals and smaller business owners what was the calling for that decision? It was the ability to make more of an impact so I, I find what I, what I truly love is I know that 
this part of people's businesses overwhelms them or, you know, it, it can make or break their business. And for a lot of small business owners, they don't have that support. And I remember being in meeting after meeting after meeting, dealing with people who were at the higher end of town, who had these large corporations and, and what I was doing wasn't really making an impact. But, you know, when I did have those dealings with those smaller business owners, you could see the relief that would be on their faces when you explain something to them and the thank yous that they gave. So I really do find working with smaller to medium sized business owners far more rewarding. I know I can have more of an impact. I can help them grow more than you. I think it's more of that satisfaction than you get than working with the, the bigger end of town. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I I spent uh, um I paid my time and did some some time in the public service. I worked for the Department of Health, both Commonwealth and and state. And I moved into I was in procurement and project management for for quite some time. And you know, one thing that you take for granted if whether you're working in government or or the corporate world is that you've got a department for everything. You know, I didn't write my own comms. I didn't uh, hire my own people. I didn't have anything to do with numbers. You know, I just sort of sent an invoice across and requested for some equipment. And it's only when you start a business and we Mm. know that we start a business because we're good at something, because we've got a calling, because we want to change the world. But then comes that, you know, we come down from that initial high and we go, oh, goodness, we also need to be the chief of marketing. We need to be the chief financial officer. We don't have all these skills and it's impossible to be able to do everything. Uh, initially at, at first it is of course numbers would be one of the most important ones but it's often the biggest struggle so why is it and what is it that business owners struggle with with numbers and keeping up with the financial side of their business I think it's a couple of things. I think especially once you've moved from employee land to business owner land, the biggest thing that I find people get themselves into trouble with is as an employee, whatever money hits your bank account is yours. Your employer has taken care of the tax side of things for you. They've taken care of the superannuation side of things. And so you budget your life off of what hits your bank account. As a small business owner, we don't have that. So where people get into a lot of trouble is they, you know, they get paid from their their clients, but then they don't provision for tax. They don't put away for super. They don't put away for their suppliers and they build their personal life around this income level, not taking into account all the responsibilities that they have. So I think that's firstly a mindset thing that we have to understand as small business owners, we need to allocate for those things. Um, And then I think the next thing is, is people just, Look, numbers aren't that great. I mean, they're necessary, but it's, it's not a skill set everybody has. And, and most small business owners, as you said, go into business because they have a product or a service or a calling and, and they don't quite understand what, it, what you need to know. But it is so vital that they do because it's the foundation of the success of their business. You know, uh, people don't understand how much money they need to make as a minimum to cover all of their expenses. So if you don't know that, how can you make decisions or they price themselves too low because they want the sale, but they don't understand that that sale could actually be costing them money. And I think we get stuck on revenue money in the door and that's all that we focus on as business owners, but there's a, a good saying, which is revenue is vanity and profit is sanity. So, you know, you could have a, a six figure business, but could be not making any money, or you could have a business which only turns over $50,000 a year and could be having this massive profit, but people look at that top line number, the money in the door and don't take into account everything else. And I think that's where they get into trouble. So I think small business owners need to educate themselves um, just so they can make some smart decisions. Yeah, even if it's the decision about when or even if to to leave uh, the, the leave being an employee completely. Mm or whether it would be better to work part-time because if you you're used to a particular salary like you've say like you say you've got to work out well how much do I actually need to make as a business owner to cover the whole lot of of that 
Yeah, thinking. it's a very different way of thinking. And how do I price to make sure that I include things like tax and insurance and super and all those all those other things? Yeah, and it's I think it's even harder when so my husband's an engineer, he's got an engineering business. It's very easy for him to calculate materials and labor and machine time and power and those sorts of things. But for those of us that have got a less tangible business mm. product, we're consulting or we're speaking or we're coaching, very hard to, to really understand what our price per unit is of, of things, which is even more a reason for us to be fully across the, the numbers. So apart from the obvious of not understanding numbers and either not having enough or getting into debt. What are some of the other risks that business owners face by uh, putting the blinkers on and not learning their, biz their business numbers? I think one of the, the hardest things that we have is people just get themselves so far down the rabbit hole of not understanding that when it comes to undoing it, you know, or only looking at their figures once a year when they do their tax return, they can't make informed decisions about things. So I think, you know, the other hard part of that is, is when they're doing their tax return, they, they don't understand. Like, so there could be a, a profit on paper. So when you do your tax return, your accountant could turn around and say to you, you've made a hundred thousand dollars this year. And the first question I always get asked is, so where is it? because I haven't got $100,000 sitting in my bank account. And I think it's about understanding not only that profit figure, but where that money goes. Have you used it in your personal finances? Have you used it to pay a liability? Have you used it to pay the ATO? Because that profit figure never is sitting in the bank account. So it's not only understanding how your business is going in terms of um, income and expenses, but also the other side, which doesn't get spoken a lot about, which is your assets and liabilities. Are you growing a business worth something or are you incurring a lot of debt and owing a lot of people? Um, because at the end of the day, that's going to get you into trouble. I think if I ask most business owners how their business is going, the first thing that they think about is, have I got money in the bank? And that's fantastic. You might have money in the bank, but by no means is that a metric to say how well your business is going because you may have $10,000 in the bank, but if you owe people $50,000, that's not a viable business. So I think it's about making sure you're across all facets of the finances. And, and again, it's not a hard thing to do. Otherwise, I say that as an accountant, no, but there are things such as your know, accounting software programs, which are quite simple and easy to use. Um, that just give you an overview, a snapshot of how things are going. And I think if you can get that set up for your business and check in weekly, fortnightly, monthly, it's far better to do that than to get to the end of the year and, and not be able to sort of see how you've gone. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's that's one I need to get better at for sure. So what are so for people that are in that category of not caring much about the numbers or or not having financial literacy struggling a little bit to understand it what would be the key things what are the numbers that we must look at when we when we're looking at our financial software sure so obviously the first one is money in the door you want to know how many sales you're making so that's your revenue yeah. and that's different for obviously for um consulting or service-based business than it is to goods basis yeah um but you basically you want to know how many sales you're making but the more important thing about the knowing what your sales is making is what your gross profit is. And what your gross profit is your sales less what it costs to make or do that thing. Now, obviously, yeah. with service-based businesses, we don't have a lot of overheads, they're called. But if you're selling a product, you're going to want to know how much that product costs you um, so you know what's left. And what is left is what we call your gross profit. And that covers your operating expenses, so your rent, your insurance, your telephone, those things. But more importantly, what comes after that is net profit. And net profit is the payment to an individual or the business for the hard work, the sweat, the tears, the missing your kids assembly because you have to go and deal with clients. And I think we get stuck on the top number. So we get yeah. stuck on the revenue and we don't take into account all the expenses that we need to pay for a business. If I said to most business owners, you know, those even those terms, revenue, gross profit, operating expenses, and net profit, most of them wouldn't have a clue. The other big one I find is debtors and creditors. So debtors, yep. 
people that owe you money. That's always a yeah. good one. We, we seem to know that. We seem to keep a real yeah. eye on that. Um, and creditors who we owe money to. Small business owners are notoriously bad for asking people to pay them. We, we just don't like it. And I find yeah. small business owners, especially those in the service-based business, struggle with our pricing because we're not, we don't have a tangible product that we're selling. So we're basically selling our time. And yeah. I think we find that we sometimes discount that a little bit because we, yeah. you know, it's, it's a mindset thing. Yeah. Um, so I think small business owners definitely need to keep a, a track of a many different things in their business, yeah. but key ones would, would be definitely focusing on the profit. And I think it, a, a typical thing that I see is someone turn around and say, oh, a, a client's asked me to do a job. It's going to cost me, say, $1,000. That's fantastic. It's a great win for me. But if I said to them, well, what's it going to cost you to do that job? By the time you put the staff on the road, by the time you pay for the materials, by the time you know you allocate so much of that to your overheads, if that job costs you $1,500 to do, that's not a good job for you. You might as well sit at home and not get the $1,000. Um, I don't know if a lot of small business owners can price their services like that or their goods and actually know what it costs them to do a job. Yeah. A, prime, a prime example, I have a landscaping company uh, as a client and I said to them, you know, how much are you charging your staff at? And they said, oh, $44 an hour. And I'm like, okay, good. How much does you, how much do your, your staff cost you? And they went, oh, $25 an hour. So we're making, you know, we're making almost $20 per hour, almost double. And I said, oh, okay, but let's, let's break that down. Your staff cost you $25 per hour, add super on top of that. For round figures, let's just go $2.50. So we're sitting at $27.50. Then add workers' compensation insurance to that. Let's just say that's another $2.50. We're now sitting at $30. Let's talk about the, the car you provide them, you know, and, and when you start listing all of these expenses, that huge profit margin they thought they were getting on their staff whittles away and whittles away and whittles away. Yeah. Um, short version is they now charge their staff out at $66 an hour because, you know, we've decided that that's what it's going to cost for every hour that they work. Yeah. I think small business owners don't go through that process because it overwhelms them, but with some guidance, I think they can really get some good tips on how to make sure that they, they're across the numbers they need to be. Yeah, that's really important. So that's sort of advice about how to, cost your your services whether it's per hour or per per outcome is that something that your that your company uh, can help with yeah any any decent accountant can definitely yeah. help with that and i think that's you know people there are a number of factors that can help when you're pricing your service and obviously you don't want to you also want to be within the market and you want to be competitive but there is a real race to the bottom and i think we're not doing anybody a, a service when we're trying to undercut each other in terms of yeah. price you also need to realize that not everything costs the same so you have to have a look at where you are in the market so if we decided that all services should be the same price under that logic a ferrari should cost the same as a little suzuki but they're not yeah. because they're different qualities they're different markets and we're okay with that as a consumer we're happy as a consumer to go to the shops and go well things cost different prices i'm going to see what fits my needs but as a business owner we're like oh no i have to be the cheapest but that's, yeah, I don't think, I think that's sort of a juxtaposition. We want to price ourselves so our business is worthwhile and we fit where we're trying to fit in the market. And that, that, you know, that may not always be at the bottom. You just have to be okay with that. Yeah, yeah. And I think that for most business owners I chat with, particularly those that are just starting or, or growing their business, if they actually stopped and counted the number of hours that they worked in a week, and what that translates to as an hourly rate. <laughs> <laughs> they, they wouldn't do it. They would run it would back be to their horrified. employment. Oh, yeah. absolutely. And I think, you know, and that I think that is, I, I get that. When I first went into business um, as for myself, it was really easy for me to say, oh, I'll do that cheaper. Oh, you know, whatever your accountant is doing it for, I will do that cheaper because I wanted the money in the door because I had a yeah. mortgage and two children. So I completely understand it. Um, and starting out in business is hard and saying no is hard because we're scared it won't, you know, something else won't come to replace it, but it does. And I think knowing your worth and knowing your value and knowing what you need to price yourself at is very important. So we don't do those things that undercut our own value and our own worth. Yeah. And, and a lot of that is mindset, isn't it? Yes. Very much so. I think the biggest thing that I get with um, small business owners is, oh, I pay so much tax. I wasn't paying this much tax as an employee. The difference is 
your employer used to pay that tax for you. So yeah. you didn't physically you have to go it. through the act of doing it. It's just us physically hitting that click button to transfer that money to yeah. the ATO, which makes it hit home a little harder. Yeah. Um, so, but definitely mindset approach to that because you want to pay tax. And I say that to my clients and they give me this funny look about, no, I don't. But you do because paying tax means you're making a profit and we yeah. want to make a profit. Otherwise, why are we in business? Yeah, so true. And I often find when I chat with fellow business owners that for for people, if they're not doing so well, or they've had a bit of a bad spell, or they're just starting out, that the first thing to often go, because we know we've got to pay the ATO, right? The, mm -hmm. the first thing to go is super. It's yes. like, oh, I can barely afford to take a owner drawings, but I, there's no way I can afford to pay super. And that's dangerous, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Especially in this day and age, they changed the super rules uh, not too long ago, where basically if you don't put money into your superannuation on a, on a regular basis, then they will cancel your insurance in your super fund because basically they're trying to protect funds yeah. being whittled away by fees and charges. However, for most Australians, the only, uh, the only insurances they have, whether that be life insurance or income protection insurance, yeah. is within their super fund. So you may find if you don't contribute regularly that you actually yeah. get your insurance cancelled, which can be catastrophic if, you know, um, God forbid, something happens to you. Yeah. Um, I think it's also we need to value ourselves as business owners. Yeah. And I know we're very good at paying everybody else first, but you also need to be rewarded for, for what it is that you're doing. And you wouldn't have your best employee who is the biggest advocate for your business, who works the longest, who, you know, who never goes home and then turn around and say to them, I'm really sorry, I'm not going to pay you this week because I can't afford to. You would make sure they're compensated. Absolutely. We are, yeah. we are the best employee our business is going to have. We're the biggest advocate. We've worked the longest hours. We just need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves. And even if that's a small amount going into superannuation yeah. to help build that up, it's tax deductible, which is fantastic yeah. um, and, and highly recommend that you they do something. And that could be $10 a week to start with. But as long as it's yeah. regular, it will definitely help in the long term. Yeah, yeah. Great advice. Great advice, Michelle. Such good value out of what you're sharing today. It's awesome. Thank so you. when would be a good time for a business owner to consider outsourcing to an accounting firm or bringing somebody in to be part of the business? Is there a sort of a particular point in business where that really just makes good sense? I think every business owner should have an accountant. And I'm not biased, um, obviously, but I think that you should have somebody that you have involved in your business to whatever degree is comfortable for you. So yeah. whether that's somebody that you see at the end of the year to do your tax return, um, that you can call throughout the year to ask questions of, that you have tax planning meetings with, it really depends on how comfortable you are with the process and how much you want somebody in. If we're talking about something along the lines of outsourcing your business activity statement or your bookkeeping, yeah. I think that comes down to a couple of things. One, your skill level, if you can do it yourself and you're comfortable with it, yeah. then obviously it's a cost to save. But if it's something that is is you're letting get to the wayside, you're falling far too, too far behind, you don't pay attention to it, then I suppose the question I ask is, what is your hourly rate as a business owner? And yeah. say that's $200 an hour is what you would like to charge yourself out at. How long is it taking you per month to do your books? And if that's five hours a month, yeah. If you can find someone that can help you for less than a thousand dollars a month, which you would easily, you need to do that. And, and I, yeah. this is the justification I had when I got myself a cleaner um, to do home. I went, okay, cleaner is thirty dollars per hour. Yeah. It takes two hours a week to clean my house. One, I hate doing it, but two, for sixty dollars, I can focus on yeah. my kids on the weekend. I can do something else. It gives me peace of mind because I know it's done. I'm not worrying about it. It's yeah. not keeping me up at night. So that's how I justified that purchase. I think bringing in a bookkeeper or bringing in somebody into your business does need to be a financial decision in terms of can I afford to do that? But yeah. also it has to be that freeing up of that mental space. If you, yeah. if you can rest easy at night sleeping, knowing that somebody's making sure you're complying with the ATO, your books are up to date, you can pull reports when you need to get the information that you want. If that costs you $100 a week, and that gives you a, a good night's sleep, 
a business owner needs to figure out if that's worth it to them. Yeah, yeah. And, and of course, working with the right accountant would also potentially save you as or bring mm. in extra money or prevent you from because you you're across what the latest legislation is or the changes, what are perhaps some of the newer initiatives. So there is, and I'd imagine you you have got some great success stories of saving your clients heap, heaps. Yeah, well, I think it's I think it's saving money in terms of you know minimizing tax, but I also think it's about educating people about what they can and can't claim. A lot of people don't know that, or the amount of times I see people asking for advice on Facebook of all places, you know, can I claim this? Should I do that? Having someone that can explain that to you in a terms that you understand, that you're comfortable with, that you, you feel good asking those questions is worth their weight in gold. And it comes down to, you know, having an advisor. That, yeah. that you can uh, you, so you're not doing the wrong thing because you know, I don't want the ATO to be scary for anybody. I don't want tax or finances to be you know something yeah. that people fear. You want to in, not enjoy it, but at least know that it's you know not stressful. Um, yeah. So I always say to people, find someone that that you look you want to engage with that you that yeah. you want to get that advice from. I do feel it's invaluable. It not only can it save you money, it can save your peace of mind. And it helps your business tick over, which, you know, your personal finances are at stake if this goes wrong. So you want to make sure you're getting it right. Yeah. And I think for those people that are perhaps not at that level yet and don't feel as though they want to bring anybody in or, or seek or seek assistance in this area. There are a lot of great tools and resources out there. And I remember, you know, they seem to have got better over the last couple of years. Mm. I mean, some of the stuff that the ATO put out is really user-friendly. Yes. It's bite-sized information. There's a lot of infographics and, and they've definitely changed the way that they communicate. So that's really good. And for the uh, software programs, I'm a zero user myself. You know, they've got a great set of tools on the, within the system, uh, onboarding stuff, little videos. So there's lots out there for you to dip in and, and learn a little bit. M- much rather that option than going to Facebook and asking you a question. Yeah. And I think, and that's right. And I think the hard thing for small business owners is we're so busy working in our businesses. So we don't take the time to get systems and processes such as Zero or MyObble QuickBooks yeah. set up because we don't want to take that downtime for the fear that it will make things harder. But it's so such a revelation once you you digitalize things and you find easier ways to do things you know they have apps now where you can take photos of your receipt so then you can throw the receipt away and it's permanently in your software system so if the ATO ever comes asking you've got a record of it you're not digging through a shoebox you know you've got things that can record your kilometers for you so you know you're getting the correct motor vehicle deductions technology is definitely your friend and you just need to sometimes take the leap of faith that it may be a little bit harder to start with, but yeah. in the long run, it's going to have benefits for you. Yeah, yeah. I used that uh, app that uh, keeps track of your kilometres. And there's also one that you hit when you're about to go to a job that tracks the time that you're spending on a job. Do you know that one? Yeah, yeah. So there's lots of them. And that's mm. fantastic um, to know, especially when you're a service-based business, because yeah. we're selling our time. So we yeah. need to know how long things cost because, you know, then you can quote similar jobs. You know what, you know, how many hours it took you. So you're not yeah. going to underquote yourself. So, yeah, lots of technology and technology is evolving, getting really, really good. Um, and I think, you know, the more you move with that, the more efficient yeah. you'll get in business and it should hopefully be easier. Make numbers not as scary as they have been in the past. Yeah, yeah. And and it's definitely worthwhile doing the tax planning appointment rather than doing the one year yeah, because it's too late then, isn't it? If you've if you've already passed that financial year and it's time to it lodge is. your tax I think return, the, um, the hard... absolutely. Yeah, I, up to thirty June is like your key time every year because everybody asks questions then. But you're like, you should have done something three months ago when it gave you more time to organise your affairs. Um, so definitely getting a tax planning meeting with you know, with someone and and yeah. look. A lot of business accountants, you know, ours included, we do free consults. We do, you know, first meeting free with people. So even if you find someone and just sit down and say, look, this is what I've always done. Even yeah. if you have an accountant, this is what they've always done. Is there anything else you can you know, let me know about? 
and you may, you know, you may never know what, you know, what you, you don't know what you don't know. Yeah. Um, and so it's just about gathering that information, but yeah, tax planning meeting, absolutely in March or April, because by the time yeah. it gets to June, it, you may be too late or past June, the, the deadline's yeah. passed and we can't do anything to help you. Yeah. So it's a bit like, you know, you go for your annual uh, women's health check or your skin check or your eye check. <laughs> what about your financial health check? And just uh, see what savings Absolutely. you can get or what else you can take advantage of because uh, none of us want to pay too much tax to, to the ATO, although, as you say, it's a good thing because it means we're making a profit. But uh, having somebody exactly. with your skills and experience on the team is, uh, well, not only peace of mind, but also uh, allows business owners to do the good stuff, what, what we all enjoy doing, what we're best at rather than getting bogged down or worrying that we're not complying or we could have done this differently or am I missing out on the latest policy or or change because there's been a huge amount of, of changes lately. So that's awesome. So who's your ideal client, uh, Michelle? Who do you work with most at Carbon Group? Uh, so we do everything from large corporations. So my, yep. yeah, my biggest client is a mining a mine here in WA yep. because... Um, <laughs> In WA, you have to have a mining client. I think everyone does. Um, and everybody in between. My sweet spot is small to medium enterprises. Yeah. So those businesses that, you know, that have, have gone out, you know, taken a punt, you know, have risked it all and, and basically want someone to, to step them through. So we don't specify an industry. Yeah. We, you know, we have people from every industry um, right. all around Australia. But it's basically about helping small business owners that, that need that hand holding that want yeah. someone in their corner and and those ones that you know want to grow and have someone along that journey with them so yeah i i hate i not that i hate the question i, I don't want to be too generic but i would my aim is to help as many small business yeah. owners as i yeah. can um and so anybody who you know who is after any sort of advice in the yeah. space we, we would love to, to be able to help them through that yeah. And as a group, you've also got complementary services. So have you got estate planning and super self-managed super other bits and pieces that you can offer? We do. So we are an accounting and bookkeeping firm. So we offer both those two core services, yeah. but we also have business and general insurance, financial broking, financial planning, um, and sort of self-managed super and those sorts of things. So um professional services, anything that anybody that is a business yeah. or is in business. Yeah. Um, we can help them. Great, great. Um, can I ask you a question about winning a 40 under 40 award? What opportunities sure. is that, has that given you? It was very exciting. Oh, it was very exciting. Um, and, yeah, it's a wonderful recognition of three whirlwind years in business. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting because I, I feel... I'm, I'm still coming to terms with it, I think, because I think I do hide the award in such high, high regard. Um, yeah. So it's it's led to a lot of uh, keynote and public speaking opportunities for me, um, which has been wonderful and um, has sort of helped cement my position at Channel 9. So I, I'm the finance yeah. expert for Channel 9 and I have a weekly spot with them. Um, it's just Thank you. It's it's just given me the opportunity to be seen as a, a leader at a, yeah. in my field, which I think is, is wonderful. Um, but yeah, it's 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 an interesting one because it's kind of like, well, where to from here? Um, so um, yeah, complete surprise that I that we won it. Um, took it out last year. We had to um, have a lovely event at Crown. But um, yeah. yeah, so it's basically just trying to it's raised the profile, which is yeah. um, lovely. Um, yeah, quite interesting company to be in. Such some amazing people took out the award. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel very honoured. Wonderful. Congratulations on, on winning that. It's been an amazing uh, chat. I've learned uh, a lot and I feel even more motivated to get better at numbers in my business. So to finish up, I like to ask my guests the same two questions. So the first mm -hmm. question is a quote or a mantra that you live by. 
uh, say yes and figure out the details later. <laughs> I like that one. Wasn't that Richard Branson who first said, say yes and figure it out afterwards? I think yeah, that's great. I think so. It's, it's done me well so far. It just pushes through the fear barrier. Like I, you, know, you, just, yeah. you just say yes and sort it out. That's a great, a great attitude to life. And uh, finally, a business book that's on your shelf, one that you go back to and you refer to over and again, over and over, a business book that should be on everybody's bookshelf. Uh, Chillpreneur by Denise Duffield Thomas. So Chillpreneur. So it's like oh, entrepreneur, but Chillpreneur. Okay. So yeah. um, basically it's a book about how business owner and entrepreneurship doesn't have to be all about the hustle, about getting up at 4am and working yourself. You know, there can be a different approach to it. Um, yeah. And I, that really resonated with me because, you know, being so new to business owner life, yeah. I think you just see the glorification of being busy and being stressed. Um, yeah. So it was a really nice eye-opening book to basically give me permission to, you know, take a different approach to things and not be so stressed and focus on the kids. And, you know, obviously being from a working mum who wrote yeah. it, it is really, yeah, I, I, I go back when I feel myself, I'm getting too worked up and too stressed. I go back and, get permission to just chill and be a chillpreneur. Great. I love that. I'm going to look out for that book. I, I've I've listened to some podcasts with with that lady, Denise Stuffel thomas Is that right? Yeah. I've listened to some podcasts and she's great. She does a lot of work around money mindset, doesn't she? She does. Yeah. So awesome. Thank you so much for sharing today. Where can people find out more about you, Michelle? Uh, carbongroup.com.au is our website, but um, we're on all the socials, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook and Instagram. Fabulous. Thank you so much for being my guest today on uh, the Business Chat podcast. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.